Coming up on iOS Today, Rosemary Orchard and I show you some ways to breathe life into your photos. These are photos you have that you want to make more out of them. Do something new with them. Make them awesome. All of the apps that will help you do that up next on iOS Today. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Wow. Wowdy, howdy, dowdy, bowdy. Welcome to iOS Today. Uh, this is the show where we talk all things iOS, tvOS, iPadOS, HomePod OS, all the OSs that Apple has on watchOS, the, S, the S's, the OSs that Apple has on offer. Uh, and sometimes we get confused about which OSs are available. I am one of your ho... <laughs> And sometimes our hosts get confused about what their own names are. That's Micah Sargent. I'm Rosemary Orchard. I'm the one who remembers my own name. Uh, Most of the time. Most of the time. Yes. Rosemary Orchard, thank you uh, for filling me in on my name and for having your name on on ready. Wow. I am broken (laughs) today, but we've got a great show planned for you. Uh, We are going to be talking about all... The apps, well, some of the apps, some of our favorite apps, for making more out of your photos. Uh, This can be, you know, apps that have great filtering and editing effects, but also apps that are able to take your photos and turn them into something amazing. So uh, we are going to kick things off by talking about certainly one of my favorite apps in general, and it's one that I've talked about before on this show multiple times. It's always getting new updates, though, and recently uh, got some new updates on the Mac um, that that kind of bring it in line with what's available on um, on iOS, and that is Pixelmator Photo, which is called Pixelmator Pro on the Mac. Uh, Pixelmator Photo is an excellent application, particularly if you aren't uh, super skilled in figuring out what you should do with your photos. If you kind of have some photos and you're going, I don't know what it is that I need to do to make them amazing, uh, Pixelmator Photo or Pixelmator Pro can step in and help you out with that job. Um, So I've got some uh, different photos here. And uh, this is the Pixelmator Pro library. And I've got this really cool photo. I recently visited Navarro Point, um, which if you've never been there and you live in Northern California, you should absolutely go. It is beautiful. Um, it's it, the, There are some bluffs and you just look over into the ocean and there were some um, uh, harbor seals there. And uh, it was just I don't know. It was just, it was astounding. But this photo I took not because I wanted a cool photo, but I took this photo because I just wanted to remember where it was that I went. But after going back and looking at it, I thought, oh, this would be a really neat looking photo if it was a little vintage. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is in the top right, I'll tap the edit button and immediately it's going to pull up some different options here in the top right. There's a little um, magic a wand icon that says ML. And then there is uh, a grid of circles. Um, The ML wand is uh, a machine learning feature that will automatically make adjustments to your photo uh, using machine learning magic. So what I love about this is uh, Pixelmator has fed a bunch of photos into this uh, algorithm or into this, you know, machine learning algorithm. Yeah, that was correct. And uh, with that, it can make some adjustments to your photo based on kind of what is thought to be good adjustments to make to this photo. Uh, The grid is for taking this photo. If I zoom in, um, you can start to see at some point when we get to pixels here, you can you can see with the V, for example, um, and you may not see so much on uh, the stream, but it, me looking at it directly on the iPad, I can start to see some pixel pixelation um, uh, on the, the edge of this V. With that button, it will use machine learning to make the photo uh, resolution even better than it already is. It's called ML super resolution. And so when you zoom in, it's less pixelated and it gives more kind of uh, more 
detail at that very close zoomed in level. The next button uh, is a little bandage icon, and that is for covering up things that you don't want in the photo. So maybe I'm not big on this because um, everything here feels very vintage and old school, but this uh, logo here in the corner Mm, that's a little more modern. So let's see, because I'm not sure about this. This is the the this is a little bit troublesome. I think it will be for um, Pixelmator or any photo editing app to figure out exactly what you want to do with it because it's right on the edge of this wooden block. So it might try whenever I use the healing tool to pull in some of the surroundings. So we're going to see what happens. Um, I'm going to start by just getting rid of the blue and we'll go from there depending on what happens. So I tap the repair icon and I'm just using my finger to rub across the blue. And you can see at the bottom, there's an option to increase or decrease the size of this uh, repair brush. And we'll go in and just completely surround this and fill it in. We're getting there. And now I've got this filled in. And when I let go, that's whenever it starts to think about what it, I'm asking it to do and try and patch this. So let's see what happens. Again, this is a little tough because of where it's placed. So here we go. And as you can see, it pulled in some of the wood from the surrounding, as well as a couple of those screws. So I'm going to try to take it one step farther and see what happens here. This is where I think it's going to probably run into an issue, but I'm curious. Um, and in fact, let me I'll undo that because what I want to do is make the brush a little bigger. just a little bit easier here. There we go. So we'll brush along the edge here and we'll come in and we'll go up to brush that out head over, just fill that in. And now we let go. And as you can see, yeah, it didn't really handle that well. This would, this is a very tough one and would end up being something that I would fix on my own. So there are some things where it's not going to work great, but say you wanted to get rid of this bolt here. This is a good example. Uh, maybe I don't like this bolt as part of this sort of vintage photo. So I can just highlight this area and let go. And there you go. Now that bolt has disappeared. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. And so mm -hmm. now we could go over and get rid of this one as well. Boom. That happened so quickly, very easy to do. Uh, and then I could go in and, and get rid of the other bolts too. Um, from there, we've got a crop icon. And this is one of the new features uh, on Mac OS that lets you um, quickly and easily uh, make a crop. I have to say, like, crops are one of the hardest things for me because there are lots of different sort of beliefs, thoughts, and... Um, suggestions for how you should crop your photo, uh, depending on, you know, what size you want your photo, but also based on the golden ratio or the, the rule of thirds or all these different, uh, rules for what makes a photo, um, pop or draws your eye to the right place. And you can learn more about that, uh, on hands-on photography, uh, twit.tv slash H O P to learn more about all things photography with Aunt Pruitt. Uh, but here, I'm going to use my built-in Ant Pruitt, which is the machine learning crop feature. So in the bottom right corner, I'll tap that and it'll look at the photo and decide how it thinks the photo should be cropped based on what's in the photo. So you can see it just barely brought things in. I'll hit reset. I'll hit that again. And it just barely brings things in. If you've got people in your photo, it will do a crop that's a little bit different um, depending on what you've done. So I'll go ahead with that. That's fine. And we'll tap on the uh, sliders icon in the top right corner. This is where things get serious. You've got options for white balance, hue and saturation, lightness, color balance, selective color, levels, curves, vignette, sharpen, grain. And if I tap customize, I can actually add more here. I can add replace color, black and white, color monochrome, sepia, fade, channel mixer, invert. All of these options are available as adjustments that you can make. And if you'll notice some of these uh, adjustments, selective color, um, color balance, lightness, hue and saturation, and white balance all have a little ML button next to them. And that is because those can all be activated using machine learning independently or with that uh, button in the top left, the magic wand. So I'm going to hit that button and we'll, I'll show you what all happens here. So we'll hit that button and immediately it goes ahead and look at the, the, the 
uh, leaves in the background, they've gotten a lot greener. I'll actually use the before and after. So on the left here is the before, on the right is the after. It uh, brought in a lot of depth in the leaves. It darkened the um, the sign a little bit more to bring out the contrast there. Uh, and let's see what it did with this. In the background, uh, the, the sky gets a little bluer and those greens, again, get a little richer. Uh, and overall, it's a better looking photo. I'll turn the before and after off and let me tap on the sliders again. And you can see the adjustments that actually took place for each of these. That's what I love about this. It's not a black box feature where you don't know what's going on. White balance machine learning is turned on and it dropped the temperature by negative uh, 2%. It tent tinted the photo by 3%. It uh, didn't make any adjustments to hue or saturation, but it did bump the vibrance a little bit. Brought down the exposure, brought down shadow brought down brightness, so it was a little bit overexposed. Uh, uh, contrast was dropped a little bit and black point was raised. And then in color balance, we can see um, that it it didn't it made a few adjustments to the shadows, uh, bringing them a little bit more uh, into the yellow green, excuse me, yellow green range. So I love that you can see what it does because then you can start to learn too. Oh, so these are adjustments that maybe I should make, uh, fit changes that I should uh, consider. And then last but not least for, uh, for Pixelmator Pro is that down at the bottom, or Pixelmator Photo in this case, down at the bottom are some different filters uh, that are available. So you can see um, previews for those different types of filters that you can add. And once again, by tapping on one of these filters, you can go into the uh, vi excuse me the visible adjustments and actually see what this has done to the photo. So it left the lightness with machine learning uh, features and the white balance with machine learning features, and it made adjustments to selective color uh, and some selections to the curves as well to make the adjustments for this photo. So I think it's super cool that instead of it just being a filter and you not knowing what the heck is happening, this goes farther by letting you actually see, excuse me, further by letting you see what um, it is actually doing with the photo. So now I'm happy with this photo. I think I will go ahead and hit that um, ML super resolution and you can see it's crunching the photo. So it's basically taking it and figuring out what's going on in the photo, looking at all of the pixels so that it can figure out how to expand or expound upon that and make a photo that's going to look good even at a closer resolution. So we'll bring that in, uh, let that crunch. And um, while it's crunching, I'm curious, Rosemary, uh, do you have any other th thoughts that you want to add on Pixelmator Photo? Because I know I just kind of ran off with it, but it's just a really cool app. It's, it's such a great app. I would like to mention it is only available on the iPad. So if you've not got an iPad and you're you're looking to use this app, um, then you're going to have to either use Pixelmator Pro on, on your Mac um, or you're going to have to use Pixelmator on your iPhone, which we'll get to in a minute um, because uh, that's one of my favorite apps. And it's a, a very different kind of app. Um, but I'm loving what you've done here, Mike. A great call with uh, making that vintage. Thank you. Yeah. So here you can see um, on the left is the before photo before it did the machine learning super resolution. And there are lots of pixels, uh, you know, kind of a, a rough edge on this V. When I bring this over to show the after, watch as that rough edge disappears That's and it gets smooth. Magic. Absolutely That's magic. Incredible. What I love about this is if you've ever used a photo printing service um, where you send your photos in online, they often get pretty kind of um, uh, snippy about you sending in low resolution photos. And they won't, and that's because they won't look good when they're big. And then people tend to get upset whenever the photo comes and it doesn't look great. So anytime I've ever used one of those photo uh, printing services, I've always ran it through the ML super resolution filter before I send it off uh, because that just gives it a better, higher resolution that looks better whenever it's printed out. Um, and then same goes, I've talked about it before. Anytime Anthony asks for... Um, a Memoji character for this show, for our thumbnail or what have you. Um, I always run it through ML Super Resolution because for some reason, Apple exports them at, they're just not very, uh, there's not a lot of resolution in the, the images that it creates. And so I can make them look a little bit better and scale a little bit better at higher, um, at, at higher resolutions with uh, 
ML super resolution. So I'll go ahead now that I've finished this photo and tap done, and then it will uh, ask me, are you sure you want to modify this photo? I will say yes. And now that photo has been modified and uh, I've got access to that and can, you know, share it or send it as I want to. So very easy to use, uh, very fun, the Pixelmator photo is, I, I feel. Uh, and Rosemary, how much uh, does, how much will people spend on this if they want to add it to their iPad? Uh, it's seven ninety nine uh, as a one time purchase up front. And uh, just uh, answering a question that's popped up in the chat room as well, Data Max has asked if is it doing this machine learning on device or in the cloud? It's doing all of this on your device, so you're going to get much better performance out of something like an iPad Pro, especially when iOS fifteen comes, because they're going to be able to ask for more RAM. Um, but even your your standard iPad that you can get or an iPad Mini can do this. It's just going to take w longer to to crunch. Uh, through those things, if it's doing a lot, um, but that's okay. You can you can sit there and uh, you know watch it watch it do the work, um, and you get some great results out of it as well. I really love that. Awesome. All right. Um, speaking of vintage photography, actually, no, Rosemary. Let's have you since I had to, to, to demonstrate that one for you. I would like to hear about one that you have um, that is. It's not. Uh, whenever you mentioned this, I thought, are we talking about the same thing? And then you explained and I said, oh, I get it. And I'm really excited to hear you talk about this next one. So tell me all about, well, I don't want to say, you say. <laughs> all right. So my pick for today, or one of my picks for today, because uh, we'll get to Pixelmator uh, later on, is Keynote. And a lot of you are going to be going, wait, what, Keynote as a photo editing application? And it's not necessarily for editing photos. Uh, but Keynote um, is actually a pretty good application for doing a whole bunch of things in which aren't slideshows because, you know, slideshows are fine, but sometimes you you want to present things in a different way and you don't necessarily have another app to do it. You already own Kino. It's free to download. Apple gives it to you with every iPad and iPhone and Mac, and then they give it to you again with every single other one. Um, and so you can actually create like little videos out of your photos pretty easily with uh, Kino. Um, and so I'm going to select this color gradient theme. Now, I should note this iPhone is running iOS 15. Uh, so if it crashes, that's why. Um, and also if there's themes here that you, you don't usually see, then that's why. I'm just going to uh, tap on the plus at the top. And here you'll see photo or video. You can also do a uh, camera. You can record audio. Um, and there's um, an image gallery as well where you can tap to add images. And then you, you can choose photos. So you can see here, I've got some photos from earlier. Um, I've got some scones and I have uh, a picture of some chocolate that I bought the other day. Perfect. So if I just tap add, uh, then it adds one. And then if I tap to go right, then it's got the other. And this is quite useful. But instead, I'm going to use the plus at the bottom. I'm just going to add a uh, three up slide because this is where uh, it gets pretty interesting because you can add photos. So this time I'm going to add the scones over here. I am going to add the chocolate over here and then down here, let's choose a photo um, and let's pick this beautiful picture of my new car. Ha ha ha. Okay, so this is not necessarily the best uh, collage as far as content goes because it's a bit rogue. Uh, you know, two food picks in a car. Um, but when I look at this now, um, and unfortunately it's rotated it automatically, so I'm just going to tap away from that. Uh, but if I were to uh, zoom in a little bit, then, um, you know, I've got a little collage here and you can actually go ahead and export. And if you look in the export options, this is where it gets fun because you can export things as an animated GIF or GIF, depending on how you pronounce it, uh, mm -hmm. which means that if you create a little keynote presentation of multiple pictures, then you can export that as a GIF and send it to all your friends and it will just auto play that in messages. Um, you can also export things as a movie and you can export as images as well. And it will export each slide or just your selected slides and you can even include individual builds. So if you use your uh, the transitions, for example, uh, to make things appear, then you can have each one of those as a separate build. Now, I'm just going to export these as PNGs and tip share. And now uh, if I pop these in Yoink, Yoink is one of my favorite apps for just sticking things in. I should probably pick it as an app cap at some point. Um, but uh, I did talk about it back in January when I joined the show. Um, and of course, iOS 15 has broken things for me. There we go. 
So now I have the stack in Yoink and a stack in Yoink is um, uh, just a way of saying this is a collection of files that were shared into me at the same time. Um, and so here you can see I've got presentation 14, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 002 and 003. And then look, this is picture one. And because I put two pictures in that first option, I have picture two. And then, of course, I've got picture three, which is just this little collage. Now, Keynote is not going to be amazing for making all of these uh, beautiful photo presentations, but it's free. And you can't really argue with free that well, especially when you just want to go, hey, I just want to put like three images together and turn them into an animated GIF. Done. Well, you can do that in Keynote in about five seconds. If, you, if you're tapping very quickly, you're certainly going to get it done in less than a minute. And the whole purpose of having these beautiful photos is for people to look at them, whether that's you or whether that's somebody else. And personally, I, I feel like being able to share these easily with my friends as uh, little animations is definitely something that uh, I should be doing more of. Um, and of course, you can also choose to take a photo. Uh, and so if I flip this around into selfie mode, then I can do that and I can pop that straight in there. And uh, that's not the most flattering picture of me, but it'll do for now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that, you know, anybody can, who has a, uh, you know, an iPhone or a, a iPad or Mac uh, these days can download uh, keynote and have it as part of their system. And so yeah. to be able to take that and make something with it uh, very easily. I remember years ago, someone asking me to, um, make them a slide for their wedding, um, slideshow for their wedding. And I used keynote for that. And I was really impressed with what keynote offered to, uh, to actually make that slideshow and that it didn't have to be some, you know, uh, application that took years to put together and, and had all these extra features that I could make something that looked good, looked professional, and it was already easy to make right there within keynote. Yeah, James in the chat room has just mentioned LumaFusion is also great for making uh, picture slideshows. Um, LumaFusion is one I have used for before for this um, as well. Um, and it can do a lot of other things. Um, but you do have to, you know, pay for LumaFusion. And Keynote is pre-installed on iOS devices when you get it. So if you've never messed around and uninstalled those those uh, apps, then uh, you, you already have Keynote. So it's worth giving it a try. And you can do some pretty great things. You can add shapes. You can add text on top of them. Um, you can really go nuts with it, which is uh, one of the reasons why I love it. And then at the end of the day, it's it's Keynote. Um, so you can also just share it as a PowerPoint if you need to. There you go. All right. This next app is one that I, um, it's been a long time since I brought it up on the show, but it's, and that's because it's kind of a, a secret superpower for me. Um, I don't like to talk about it because I don't want people to know about it because I want to be the one that uses it. But no, it, I joke. Uh, I really think that um, this app is one that a lot of people don't know about has been my experience, but in using it, um, I just love what it does. It's called RNI Films, and RNI stands for Really Nice Images, uh, and it's true to its word. It makes really nice images uh, using it. It the, the developers of these filters um, got real uh, film. Um, what is what's is the word I'm looking for? Sort of used real film to make filters that matched that real film so that you can get a photo that looks like it was taken with one of these uh, cameras. So let me show you. I'll uh, switch over to my iPad here and pop open RNI films. And oh, look, there's that photo again. That's because this photo is great uh, due to the, the different colors that are available here and uh, what all we're working with. So at the bottom of the screen, um, you can see the, the film packs that are available. And these film packs are what you use to decide which film you want to use. So look at this, Agfa Color 40s. And I mean, already I'm in love with this image. <laughs> like I just turned on the first one and already I love what it did with this photo. Mm -hmm. That's what I really like about uh, R&I Films is like you almost can't miss. I will say... Um, and we've talked about it uh, on the show uh, and uh, some other shows as well. Uh, no, we didn't talk about it on the show. Um, we, I've talked about it before uh, on the Twit Network, and uh, it's kind of a well-known thing that film in its uh, original um, in its original iteration was not made for people of color. Uh, it was made to capture white skin. 
And so that is the one thing that I will point out. If you or people you take photos of are uh, have any color to their skin, um, the there are many uh, a, a film pack that don't look good with it. Um, and so you do kind of have to find one. But um, that also speaks to, in my opinion, uh, that also speaks to the level of accuracy that RNI captures with these film packs, because it isn't yeah. making adjustments to what the original film did. Um, and so that's, I, I find very interesting. Um, basically I look like crap with most of these filters. There are only a few of them that look good and that's a huge bummer. And, you know, I, there are lots of things to talk about with that. And, uh, companies are trying to be better about that with modern filters. But, uh, speaking of these original filters, it's really fascinating to see how accurate they've gotten. So, uh, Agfa color forties, then there's like a warm option an aged option. I'm going to scroll through here so we can get to technicolor. Uh, and as you go through, there's Kodachrome, Kodachrome fifties, all of these look so great. 60s faded. Uh, we'll go through and let's see some other ones. So these are the vintage person, options. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I personally find like these filters are much better on things like landscapes and so on anyway, because mm -hmm. a landscape is something, I mean, obviously landscapes change over time, you know, um, riverbeds of roads and things like that, you know, so, so things do change, but a photo taken now could you know, with a little bit of uh, filters and Photoshop work easily have been taken 50, 60 years ago. Uh, but a That's photo of true. a person, our clothes change massively, our hairstyles, our makeup, mm -hmm. our glasses, everything. I mean, just our height even um, changes over the years in our build. So it's, it's uh, you know, I, I love having these filters available and you don't have to use them on people. Um, and uh, I love the fact that they work so well, especially I find they work, they feel, I feel like they work better on landscapes anyway. Uh, that's That's a really good point. Uh, we'll switch from vintage to negative here, and you can see some of these uh, film styles. Um, there's Kodak. People are familiar with Kodak uh, and Fuji. Look at that one. Uh, if you tap and hold, you can do a before and after for any of these. Um, and let's see what else. Now you start to get into, you see this little uh, yellow or gold icon at the bottom um, with the cart icon. Uh, the app is free to download and use the uh, film packs that are available. If you want to add more, it's $3.99 per film pack. Um, and you you have to purchase in order to preview because they don't want you to, you know, take a screenshot of it and then download it there. But you do get a little preview of how they look uh, by the, the little interstitial that pops up. We'll switch to slide. So this, these were the uh, films that were, you know, photos taken that would end up in slideshows, uh, speaking of keynote. And then uh, instant, which a lot of people are, of course, going to love. You've got Fuji options. You've got uh, the Instax, for example. And then you've got Polaroid, uh, which everybody is, uh, I think, <laughs> familiar with. So there's the Polaroid option and some of the, the filters that are available there. And then black and white. Um, there's some really pretty black and white options here too. Uh, so then after you've chosen the film uh, that you want to go with, I'm going to just choose a random one here really quick. We'll go with um, I don't one that looks. Wow. We'll go with that one because it really stands out. So um, I'll tap on the kind of toolbox icon here. And here's where things get even better. So we can make adjustments to all of these different features. Brightness, contrast, strength, clarity, grain, shadows, highlights, pre and post warmth, pre and post tint, saturation, sharpness, uh, vignette, fade, and dust. So I'm only going to talk about some of these um, these these sort of particular features because I think these are really cool. First, I'll mention strength though, strength though, because um, this is how much of that filter is applied. And we'll keep it at 100 just so you can see that. But grain, so right now there's no grain applied to the photo, but if I start to bring, bring up the strength, it applies some grain to the photo. There's the before and after again. Uh, the one thing that I don't like about RNI films, and this is quite literally the only thing, is that I can't zoom in on the photo to get a closer look. So whatever size screen you have, that's kind of the, the extent of it, unless I, you know, come out of these settings. So um, I've applied some grain, but let's come over here to the dust option. 
uh, a lot of original photography, which was taken on these, you know, Polaroid style and in, instant uh, photography cameras, or even some other ones, they didn't have built in methods to clean the lens. And so there was dust on the lens. Uh, if I hit the little dice icon, that will randomize the dust. And you can see um, it's added here, I'll, I'll tap and hold and then let go so you can see the difference. Uh, some dust and some specks and some hair uh, that got on the lens. And you have options here. So to the right of the dot in the middle of the uh, dust setting, it will make the dust white. And the closer you get to the center, the more transparent it is. And then to the left of the dot will make the dust black. So you'll see as I start to bring this button back toward the middle, it is decreasing the um, opacity of that dust. So you can do it kind of light where it doesn't stand out. As I bring it more toward the left, it will increase the opacity of the dust while also making it black. So you have those two options. It can either be black dust or white dust. And the opacity um, depends on where you have that filter set. I tend to like the white dust um, if I do dust at all. And so that's there on the right. And then when I'm done with my image, I can hit the share sheet button to export that photo. Um, it also has a crop tool in the top left corner. So you can do all the photo editing that you would normally do on a photo all within RNI film while also getting uh, the really cool film packs that they have available that are hyper accurate. Uh, RNI Films also makes a few other um, applications. There's RNI Calibri um, and R and I, I think it's throwback or a flashback. And with both of those, uh, flashback and Calibri, it kind of, um, it, it does the stuff for you. So if you're not big into tuning and adjusting and making how you want to, you pop this into R and I, uh, flashback, you hit the one button and then it shows you a new photo, uh, or it shows you your photo edited however it has done it. And you can just keep tapping that button until you find something that you really like. I have used that before too, whenever I didn't feel like doing anything. And once again, ended up with photos that I really loved and to this day still have and cherish. Uh, so you should really try the RNI uh, app or any of their apps, RNI Flashback, RNI Films, and RNI Calibri. And they just recently came out with a new one. <clears throat> Um, let me head to the app store here. Um, R and I, cause I'm trying to remember what it is called. Arrow, R and I arrow. Yeah. And so this one is a, uh, it says it will effortlessly make your photos look mesmerizing and surreal. Like if they were shot on an infrared film. So this, um, you really kind of have to take the photo to understand how it works. Uh, but this is, this is a new, or this is not a new kind of uh, film, but it's a very unique kind of infrared film that was originally created for military use, a uh, film that could capture heat in, uh, in the shot. And by doing that, it kind of gives you this otherworldly sort of elven quality. So it can make for some really interesting photos uh, if you would like to check that out as well. Uh, so yeah, that's r and I the whole suite of tools that they have available. Um, really fun to quickly get a photo that you might want to have printed and, you know, to hang on the wall. All right, Rosemary, what is your next pick? Well, my next pick is we're going back to Pixelmator, except this time we're just looking at Pixelmator, just Pixelmator. No, no pro, no photo. Um, but Pixelmator is the original app um, and it's it still exists. It's a $4.99 one-time purchase and it's great for doing a whole bunch of things. So to start with, you can select a photo um, and uh, I'm just going to import this picture of Smudge, who was my foster kitty and she had to, and she uh, she got adopted, which was great. Um, to start with, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. So you can do like the image setup where you can, uh, you know, set the size of it. You can constrain proportions as well. So if you want to adjust it down to a specific size, then you can do that. Uh, I'll just pop that back. You can also rotate and flip the image. Um, and then once you've made all these changes, of course, you can apply them or you can undo, reset, or just straight up cancel that. But there's also uh, some other options here. So I can retouch uh, things. So there's obviously there's lightening and darkening. There's a smudge effect, saturation, desaturation, softening, cloning, etc. So I'm going to try this clone tool because let's face it, one cat is never enough. So I am going to try and clone 
from here. That's there we go. I have managed to insert a second cat in my picture. Done. Okay, so that worked fairly well. I mean, I'll I'll admit that having the patio door in the background is not ideal, but I do indeed have a second cat. So the next step I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just uh, retouch things a little bit here. Um, and uh, no, I don't want the clone tool. I am going to use the lighten tool because it looks to me like Smudge is a bit, a bit dark down here, like where her paws are right here. That's a little dark. So let's just lighten this up because she actually has beautiful white fur. Um, and there we go. Look at that. Her chocolate brown fur is staying the same color. Um, and uh, you can tell because I've now got two cats on here, uh, you know, how much the lightening has improved things. And, you know, if I lighten my patio doors a little bit, because those are actually white, not gray, you'll see how much of an effect this has. It's also the option to sharpen. So if I just zoom right in, then you can see her fur is a little bit fuzzy in some places. And, you know, she is a cat, but I could go ahead and I can just sharpen that up. So I'm just rubbing my finger over uh, her front here. Um, and that, might not be coming across in the live stream, but I pro in in the live stream or the video if you're watching that. But I promise you, it is indeed sharper. Um, and of course, we can also smudge things. So, for example, if I wanted to just smudge at the bottom of this here, then I can do that. And then there we go. It now looks like she's floating a little bit because you know she's a magic cat. Uh, I think I'm going to undo my smudging effects there. Um, but there's more to Pixelmator than just you know photo editing. This is where you can do more. So you can add more pictures. So if I wanted to add some pictures of car, you can also add layers. Um, and there, there are colored layers, there's gradient layers, and there's even these pattern layers, which can be really useful if, you're, if you wanted to, you know, make a little collage of something. But you can also add text and there's a couple of different font options here. Um, and then you can also add shapes. So I'm going to start by adding some text um, and I want something that very much, um, you know, speaks to Smudge's personality here. And she was quite a fussy cat, um, but fussy in the most loving of manners. So I think this will incorporate that quite well. So I'm going to put Smudge, there we go. Um, and I'll put that up here at the top. And now if I tap on the paint options, then I have different choices here. So to start with, I can do style. And I'm going to start by adding a stroke around this. And I'm going to increase the size of that stroke to try and make it a little easier to read the word smudge because otherwise you've got black. It's a kind of dark picture. Uh, and so that's a little difficult to read. Let's just zoom in on that. Um, and uh, let's change the color. She's a girl cat. So let's go with pink. Pink has only recently been uh, associated with girls until I think the 50s or the 60s. Uh, it was a masculine color, but nowadays everyone associates pink with girls. So let's go with pink. Um, and I'm also going to add a little bit of a shadow to this. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, that, that's okay on the shadow. I could, I could increase the offset if I wanted to, uh, but that starts looking a bit silly perhaps. Um, and I'm just going to add a reflection. There we go. 50% uh, reflection. Perfect. So now, now, you know, this is getting better. If we want an adoption poster, um, you know, you're going to want to, you know, make it stand out. This is possibly not the best way of making it stand out, but, you know, um, I'm, I'm doing some of this for the effect here. Um, and then I'm going to just add a cute little heart and uh, I will resize this heart over here and pop that down there. There we go. So now I have a cute image um, and... Um, uh, if I wanted to at any point, by the way, I there's ruler and guides. Um, so I've just toggled on the ruler. And if I move this around, then you'll see um, there's, or you can only just about see, I think, on the, on the live stream. But here in person, I can see some hairline images um, helping me see that that heart is now exactly in the center, horizontally and vertically. If I move it down, it stays in the center vertically, but it's no longer in the center horizontally. Um, but then when I'm done... This is where this is great because I, I can just send a copy of this um, as it is. And I can also copy it to photos or save to photos. Now, there, there's a difference here. Okay, save to photos overwrites my existing image, which you may or may not want to do if you're adding text and so on because you're making an adoption poster, you're probably going to want to copy it to photos so you've still got the originals. Whereas if you are just improving a photo like Mike has been doing, um, then you're going to want to save photos. So I'm going to copy this to photos and then that's done. That's been copied to my photos. Um, but I'm just going to go back here and it's saved that and it's saved that as a PXM, which is a Pixelmator image. 
And if I go to create another image, then it comes up with whatever album you opened recently. If you have to go back to photos, then you can see all your albums and everything. Um, but there's also some presets. So you could take a picture with your camera straight away. You can do a landscape portrait. Uh, you can even do custom if you need to create an image with a custom size. Um, and then um, if you scroll down, there's also paper sizes, US and European. There's common web sizes, including things like Facebook cover images, uh, Twitter cover images, Instagram profile images, uh, 720 film, um, iPhone app icon sizes, things like that. So, and there's even device sizes, which if, if you're one of those people that needs something in a specific device size from time to time, that can be very useful. But the last option I want to cover here is these templates. Um, and so I mentioned before, you know, you can create some of this with Keynote and you can um, do a lot with that. But if you're if you're willing to spend $4.99 um, for Pixelmator, then you can really dive into these templates. And they've got everything from posters um, to photos with like, for example, these color rays. Um, and these templates are on the internet and uh, you have to download them. So uh, this one is just downloading and it should pop open in a second. It's thinking about life. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, so now I have color rays. Okay. And if I swipe over from uh, from the right hand side, so if I'm swiping Swiping right, uh, sorry, swiping from left hand side, which means swiping right. You can see color rays is a layer here. And then I've got this image, which is a stock photo. So I'm gonna tap this and then I am going to pop this picture of my car in there. Whoa, okay, now it looks like it's going really fast. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of some of the things that you can do um, with these templates. Um, and of course you can always add uh, more images, but there, there's all kinds of collages and so on. And so you can do lots of great things with these. And of course you can also then copy layers and paste those in something else. So for example, if you like this splash effect, and of course that's gonna take a little longer to download. Um, so, it, but if you like the splash effect, then you can open it up. You can tap, you can swipe in to show the layers. You can tap on the layer. Um, and you'll actually see there's two different layers here. Um, and you can also do, you know, duplication of layers and so on, but I'm just going to copy that. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go in here and then it should give me the option to paste. I think it's hiding from me today. Um, but, uh, you can usually copy and paste between photos, layers between photos as well. And of course you can also, uh, if you want to hide a layer. Um, so if you like one of the effects and you want to be able to reuse it, then you can just export that. Um, and then, you know, uh, reuse it somewhere else if you save it as a PNG. Once a layer is hidden, it gets squished over here and then you, you just tap on it to show it again. Um, but that is Pixelmator in a nutshell. There's a lot you can do with it and it's only $4.99. And, it, you know, Pixelmator Photo is a great application. Um, but if you want to have something that's going to work on your iPad as well as your iPhone, uh, on your iPhone as well as your iPad, then Pixelmator is going to be uh, a good call because uh, it works on both. Nice. Yes. Um, again, made by the folks that do uh, Pixelmator photo. So it's a, a solid app that you can definitely count on, I feel. Um, yes. <clears throat> all right. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of this segment. Uh, you could check out all of these fan fantastic apps. Uh, of course, we've got links to all of them in the show notes. Um, and let's go ahead and move on to the news. It is time to talk about the news. Up first for news is uh, the fact that the public betas are now available. Uh, if folks want to try out the next versions of iOS and watchOS and uh, iPadOS, as well as macOS, uh, then now is the time to hop on that train choo-choo uh, because the betas are available. Um, you can go to Apple's website, beta.apple.com, and uh, sign up. And you can then uh, participate in the launch and share your thoughts and find bugs and help out. That's the whole idea with the public beta is that you are there to help test uh, iOS 15 before it launches to the general public later this year. Um, the public betas tend to be more stable than the uh, developer betas. That said, it is still a beta and therefore will not be as stable as the release software that comes uh, later okay. this year. So be mindful of that. And particularly when it comes to watchOS, if you choose to participate in the watchOS beta, you must understand that you will not be able to 
unenroll from that beta, meaning that the software on your Apple Watch will remain the beta software. So if you decide, oh no, it's eating the heck out of my battery, or it, this app that I use keeps crashing or won't, you know, won't launch at all, you're stuck. Um, yeah. And so that is a big decision. It's why I actually didn't install the developer beta for watchOS the first, with the first beta. I waited until beta two uh, to install it. And uh, it's just because I did not want to end up with a bricked device or have a lot of issues. Yeah. So just yeah. that's something to be mindful of. But um, yeah. yeah. And for anybody thinking... I'm a magical unicorn. I never have battery issues um, on my Apple Watch. It's absolutely fine. I am also a unicorn when it comes to my Apple Watch. My battery lasts me all day. Everything goes great. I wear it at night while I sleep. I barely need to charge it. Currently charging my watch three times a day. So <laughs> either if you're if you're going to go with the beta on your Apple Watch, be willing to live with a charger or be willing to live with a mostly dead watch um, because it, that is going to happen. You could wait until later into the beta program. You can say, hey, I want to remove this certificate so that betas don't get installed on your watch anymore, but it's just going to stay at whatever the, the release is that you've got installed on your watch until there's you know a public release, which is going to be in September. Uh, and just to be clear, that's two months from now, at least. It could be three months. Uh, so bear that in mind with your Apple Watch. You can revert your iPhone. You can revert your iPad. You can even revert your Apple TV, but you can't revert your watch. It is a one-way trip. Um, and they do not do refunds. Um, and if a developer has an issue with it, then they've previously, in some cases, had to just exchange the watch because it's bricked them. So please bear that in mind. There you go. Um, then as far as uh, the rest of it, yeah, if you need to go back, you can. Um, so, you know, those you don't have to be as worried about, which is good. Yeah. Um, and there are guides, lots of guides, uh, including the Mac Rumors guide that's available to show you how. But also um, one of my favorite places to go as I am uh, an alumni is uh, iMore, uh, which has fantastic how-to guides for downgrading from whatever you have to uh, whatever is more stable for you. So, um, of course, always you can reach out to us uh, as well and we can answer your question on the show. Um, but do give those guides a give those guides a go first before um, we step in to help. All right, yes. moving on to the next one. This is exciting for those of us who have new um, oh, yeah. iPad hardware, right? So we've got yeah. this, I, these new iPads um, that have so much uh, processing power. And one of the things that folks said at the very kind of kickoff of these new iPads that um, have even more RAM than have in the past, that that might be the case, but uh, developers can't take advantage of that more RAM that's available because uh, iOS limits the amount of RAM that an app can make use of. Well, that's changing, isn't it, Rosemary? Yeah, it is. Um, and this is something I'm very excited about. So just to put this in perspective, I have the new iPad Pro and I got the one terabyte version. Okay, that comes with 16 gigabytes of RAM. The iMac that I purchased, which is purple and it's a 24 inch iPad uh, iMac, has a one terabyte SSD and 16 gigabytes of RAM. So my iPad is just as powerful as my iMac. Okay, my iMac's got a bigger screen on it, but aside from that, it, it's pretty much, you know, the same device. Um, and so it would be really good if app developers could request more RAM. And that's what the new uh, entitlement that app developers can request will allow uh, developers to do. So a standard app um, is not going to just, uh, you know, be able to do this. You're going to have to request permission to do this. But apps like, for example, Procreate, we didn't talk about Procreate today, but that is a great uh, drawing tool um, rather than a photo editing tool, but Pixelmator uh, Pro or Photo rather will be able to request more RAM. And some of the games that we previously talked about on the show, Civilization VI, Divinity, Original Sin, those are going to be able to request more RAM as well because they can actually make use of it and it will make their app either faster or just more efficient. Um, and so, you know, just because it's actually running faster doesn't mean you're necessarily going to see something running faster. Um, but if you think of sometimes, you know, uh, videos where there's videos or films which are made for huge sc cinema screens, when you watch that on your device, you don't need to be watching everything, but somewhere something is going to change it so that you're watching a slightly lower resolution version. Well, now that could potentially be done on device because these apps can request uh, more RAM so that they're able to do that. 
Um, so just to be clear, uh, usually an app only has access to five gigabytes of RAM, okay? Five mm -hmm. out of 16. So you can have three apps using all of their RAM allowance, um, and then you know there's one gigabyte for everything else. Now, the iPad's very smart about this. It knows when you stop using an app. It knows when you start using an app. It saves that stuff off. Um, and so just because you see the apps in the app switcher doesn't mean that they're using your RAM. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, but um, it, you know, so now apps will be able to request more, which I think is just great, um, you know. Plenty of apps don't have high RAM requirements, like a task management application doesn't necessarily have high RAM requirements. Swift Playgrounds, on the other hand, probably does. So this is great. Love it. I'm, I'm really excited about this. Yeah. Uh, as, as you said, I think the important thing to note there is that because um, some people were saying, I saw some people saying, you know, you don't necessarily need to have that RAM entitlement if you're uh, developing correctly. And sure, like I understand where that's coming from and, you know, where what that that yeah. sort of mentality. If you think is. of somebody that's creating a huge film project or something, though, they've got loads of photos, they've got video clips and things like that in there. All of that has to be instantly accessible. SSDs are fast, but the purpose of RAM is it's faster. Um, and, you know, people have always said, you know, um, James in the chat room, who needs more than 640K of RAM? Well, that's that's what we had back in the day, you know, back when computers were big bricks and then there were massive CRT monitors um, as well. Um, and, oh, you'll never need more than two megabytes of storage. Um, oh, wow. Every single photo I take now is more than two megabytes. Um, and, you know, so some apps will need this. Not all apps. Um, and some apps that are coded badly might request, um, you know, this access and I sus this entitlement. And I suspect uh, that entitlement will be rejected uh, for those apps. But things like Procreate, where you've got thousands of layers potentially, or LumaFusion, you've thrown loads of audio and video and, and photos into there that they're going to benefit from this agreed all right um what's next oh this is interesting rosemary and you are the person yeah. to talk about it uh the the you know, in the United States, uh, we have our own level of um, right to repair advocacy, but it is uh, rather powerful in the UK and particularly in, uh, in GB. <laughs> uh, so yeah. tell me more about this. Okay, so um, the European Union, um, which the United Kingdom used to be part of up until the 1st of January this year, to be clear, um, had um, a right to repair law, which came into force in March. Um, now, because the United Kingdom used to be part of the European Union, we had to get all of the European Union laws and write them into British law uh, before we left. Otherwise, you know, things would have been rather chaotic. Um, and um, the UK agreed to this rule before it left. So they, they implemented it as well. But the way that they've implemented this right to repair law is it says it covers televisions and other electronic displays, um, as well as, um, you know, things like appliances for your home. The thing is, is an electronic display does not mean your iPhone. Now, you might think, but my iPhone has an electronic display. What's going on here? Well, this law is very specific. It covers dishwashers, washing machines, washing machines and that also do drying, refrigeration appliances, which I believe also inc uh, includes freezers, um, and televisions and monitors and things like that. But various things are excluded Cookers, hubs, tumble dryers, so just a dryer um, that doesn't wow. have a washer, a microwave, laptops, and smartphones are not covered. Um, and some people think that there's behind-the-scenes lobbying from companies like Apple to try and prevent this from coming in. I yeah. think more of the, the problem is these devices were never designed um, for people to be able to repair it. Because right. what the requirement of this law is, is manufacturers are legally obliged to make spare parts available to consumers so appliances can be fixed. Um, and things like dishwashers um, and washing machines are not something where you're just going to stick it in your bag and take it to the store um, and say, hey, give me the part for this um, that's broken. You know, you're, they're going to have to have a repair person come out um, and, and check what's broken in it. Um, and, um, you know, if my iPhone breaks... Yeah, I mean, it would be nice to be able to just buy a display and get anybody to install it. But Apple is already expanding their repair program with their third-party um, 
uh, companies. Um, so the certification for that is now free. You still have to buy equipment from Apple to be able to repair things, but things are improving there. Now, I'm not saying that the UK law is right here, um, but it, you know, I think they have to start somewhere and starting overly broadly where things are then impossible is never a good idea. So, you know, it, it would be nice if my cooker could also be repaired. Um, but this law it only covers things for seven or 10 years after the discontinuation of the product. Um, and uh, so the, I think discontinuation also has to be defined somewhere, but I've not read through the full legalese to find out exactly what that is. This is all very interesting because I 100% support that um, idea. I, uh, if my dishwasher breaks and I have the wherewithal to fix it, I should have the ability to fix it. And I remember um, there was one uh, there was one piece in a dishwasher that I had that I could not find online anywhere. And I finally found it, but it was from some random thing, and so it was way more expensive than it should be. It you know the price was ridiculous, and I thought. If I knew someone close by with a 3D printer, I could get this piece made for far less money than this would cost. And there are times whenever, you know, your things break and you could, uh, in theory, fix them. And it's not made, you know, it, it seems to be that they've purposely made it um, hard to fix. It's interesting to me that the dryer is not included. And I wonder if that has to do with safety concerns, given that a dryer uh, works with heat and um, I mean, all of the stuff that's possibly, involved with that. but you would think that the washing machine, which is the one that has water and electricity in it, <laughs> would be the one that they would would say, no, 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 we're not putting a right to repair on this. Because you know that whole thing about water and electricity not combining not, them because you might kill yourself, yeah. um, especially over here. You know, we've got 240 volts. Oh, um, that's right. 230. Oh, that's so, true. You know, messing around with electricity when you don't know what you're doing is much more likely to come with a very, very, very high price tag. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, it's interesting. Uh, the the fact that dishwashers, washers and washer dryers are included, but tumble dryers are not. Uh, that said, I have, and I'm just going to grab onto my desk because it's made of wood, a 10-year-old cooker, a 10-year-old washing machine and a 10-year-old dryer, 10-year-old fridge and a 10-year-old freezer in my kitchen right now. And they're all working Fine. So I'm going to cross my fingers. The previous occupants of this place paid for decent quality appliances and that they stay working for at least the next couple of years. Yes. Uh, as someone who has fixed their dryer before um, and how involved that process ended up being, uh, it's it's nice to not have those things mess up on you <laughs> if you can help it. Yes, but again, it if, you, if they do and you know how to and you want to, you should be able to fix it um, for sure. All right. Uh, let's see. What's next? Oh, um, Controller is uh, an app that if you've got smart home stuff, uh, this is a great way to help with your uh, home kit setup. So, um, yeah. nine to five Mac has put together a guide on controller and in the past, and, uh, it's got some new features out. So tell me yeah, a little bit about it controller. Does. So controller for home kit saved my bacon a couple of times. I accidentally reset my Eero hub at some point, uh, not my Eero hub, sorry, my Aquara hub. My Aquara hub's got all of my sensors in it. So my door sensors, my window sensors, motion sensors, all of oh, these no. things that actually make my automations happen. Um, and fortunately, at some point, I'd, I'd done some some backups with controller for home care. Um, and so I, I repaired the Aquara device. I got everything back into it. Um, and um, it was great. Um, and then, you know, all the stuff was back in home care. It had the right names um, and everything. Um, but it wasn't lined up with my automations. And I was like, oh, darn it, how do I fix this? And I remembered you had this little app cap at some point with backups for your home kit. And I'm there going, I must have downloaded it and done a backup. Please tell me I downloaded it and I did a backup. I downloaded it and I did a backup, Micah. Oh, um, and he, so I was able to restore all of my automations that were broken um, because uh, the controller for HomeKit app had this backup for me and it allowed me to match up my devices and say, hey, this is this and this was this and so on. Uh, but one of the new features they've added is one that is near and dear to my heart. So Prime Day was last week uh, and I got these. These are the Philips Hue white ambience bulbs. 
Now I have a white bulb above me right now. And I, so I bought these white ambience thinking, okay, great. I'll just open the Hue app. I'll tap replace. Um, I'll remove one. I'll stick the new one in. It will, everything will just magically work. And so I open the Hue app when these arrive and there's no replace option. So I tweet the Hue people and they go, no, 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 that, that that's not a feature. Um, and then somebody tweeted me, hey, you can use controller for HomeKit. And then they're going, oh, yeah, but I've got like thousands of automations. This is going to be an absolute pain. I'm going to have to do it one light at a time. And then controller for HomeKit tweeted back at me and said, hold on to your hat. We've got a feature coming specifically for replacing what? devices. And so I was actually on their test flight. So I actually tested this out in my living room. And it works. It's great. I replaced my two living room lights um, with from white to white ambience bulbs. Um, and it worked. And I used controller for home kids to do it. So I had to pair the bulbs with Hue and then I replaced them in the in the controller app and then I unpaired the old ones uh, in the Hue app. Um, and uh, it worked. It's great. This app That's is fabulous. Incredible. People, if you have a smart home, just make a weekly task to go into control of a home kit and tap the backup button and then forget about it. Because at some point, something might go wrong. If you're running a beta, something will go wrong. I absolutely 110% guarantee it. I've had so many wonky things happening over the last couple of weeks because I'm running betas. Um, and it's my own fault that I've got backups and backups make having problems considerably less painful. That is Awesome. I am downloading this app immediately. Uh, well, you were the one that recommended it to me, Micah, so I'm pretty certain it's already installed on your phone. Well, there we go. <laughs> um, all right. This last one is really exciting. Uh, friend of the show, friend of us, uh, and uh, co creator and uh, founder of the Relay.fm network, uh, Stephen Hackett has created something for any Apple geek to get into uh, that, that I think anybody who has any sort of, you know, uh, love or interest in what Apple does uh, to be excited about this. So this is a, a Kickstarter campaign that Stephen Hackett has launched for a calendar that you can get for 2022 that is all about Apple history. Uh, this features Apple hardware dates as well as um, custom photography that Stephen Hackett took uh, from his museum uh, of Mac hardware, or I should say Apple hardware. Um, and it is filled, If we, can, I don't know if you can find the Kickstarter link. Um, I would love to show, uh, I think he has a few previews of what the dates will look like. Um, I love the detail that he chose for this. So the dates uh, that have interesting tidbits are in the Apple six colors. So there's like, you know, green, yellow, uh, purple, and orange and, and others. And each of those, uh, whenever you see that color, it will have a history uh, tidbit. So it could be, you know, when this product launched and this product ended and everything in between. Um, so this is just for every Apple nerd. Now you'll notice that it was a $5,000 goal. What I found hilarious and amazing is that he... Um, announced this in a tweet as a quick way to be like, okay, I'm going to write up something later for this, uh, but here for folks who want to kind of get in on the ground floor. And you go there and it was, uh, he was trying to raise $5,000. And when I looked, it was at like $4,000. Now, a day later, it's at $18,444. There are 428 people who have backed this. Uh, so it's absolutely going to happen. What's cool is that uh, Stephen Hackett is using a printer uh, based in, I believe it's based in Memphis, that actually uh, did printing for Apple back in the early days. So that is really neat. Um, it'll, that, you know, there's a little bit of Apple history there, but uh, that's going to be a local printer that's creating these. And uh, he's already made the whole calendar. So it's one of those things where you back it on Kickstarter and you don't have to feel super scared about it uh, not coming. Um, and then also, uh, you know, he said the the foreseeable issues that could be would be if there's something, you know, in the printing process that uh, he wants to redo or, or, you know, make adjustments to. But then because it's a local printer, he can do that pretty easily. So, um, yeah, if you're into that kind of thing, there are different uh, backing levels. Some get you stickers and uh, some will get you postcards. Uh, but ultimately, you can get an Apple history calendar with uh, the photography that uh, Stephen Hackett has taken uh, from his own collection of Apple gadgets. 
So yeah. pretty neat stuff. And uh, for anybody like me who doesn't live in the US um, and, and uh, you know, the, the shipping prices are, to be clear, out of Stephen's control. He has to, you know, ship it with uh, a company that's actually going to get it to you. So he doesn't want to just stick it in an envelope and hope for the best. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you are somewhere else and you, you find the shipping, shipping charge takes that, you know, the calendar out of your budget, there's a digital download available where you can just get the images as desktop wallpapers, um, which is one of those great options. So uh, I highly recommend taking a look if you're interested. There you go. Uh, all right, folks. Uh, I believe it is time to move on to Shortcuts Corner coming next. It's time for Shortcuts Corner. This, folks, is the part of the show where people write in with their shortcuts requests uh, to Rosemary, who is the shortcuts expert uh, among experts, uh, to provide some help for creating shortcuts uh, for our guests, so, or our, our, our audience. So the first one comes from Bryson, who writes in, I'm trying to build a shortcut automation for bedtime that asks me if I want an alarm in the morning, and if so, do I want my sleep schedule alarm or a different time to wake up? Is it possible to do this with the sleep schedule alarm, and can I create it so that only one alarm gets turned on? Bryson, I'm actually right there with you on this one. Uh, I have, have uh, had to figure out how to go about setting this up because sometimes, even though it is best for your sleep to wake up at the same time each day and go to bed at the same time each day, there's something very um, humbling and sort of uh, uh, kind of there's something that reminds me too much of my mortality about, <laughs> about that. It's like, oh man, if I make that the exact same time to bed and the exact same time to wake up, it doesn't offer any chance for randomness in my life, which makes me feel like life is more exciting. So, uh, I on occasion do have alarms that go off at different times in the morning. Um, and so, yeah, I'm curious about this as well. Bryson, uh, has the question. I'm curious, Rosemary, if you have the answer. So I've looked at this and I've I've tackled this about eight different ways today. Um, and the solution that I have, Bryson, is perhaps not the solution you were looking for because it ends up not using shortcuts at all. Um, and so I'm just going to pop over to my iPhone here. So my iPhone is in sleep mode and I'm using that sleep mode through Apple Health, but I've turned it on manually. Um, and uh, you'll see in the middle here, it says do not disturb and shortcuts. Now, if you tap on these shortcuts... Um, then as well as my custom shortcut that I've set up in the health app, I also have alarm on. And if I tap on alarm on, then I can choose to skip it once or I can change it and I can change it just once. Okay. And this is something that I've been messing with. And I, I my problem is I don't have another iPhone, uh, Micah, that's running iOS 14. Um, but I can just adjust this uh, once and then it will tell me, okay, for example, now if I'm getting up at six o'clock tomorrow morning, this does not meet my sleep goals. So I'm going to have to go to bed a little bit earlier uh, to try and meet my sleep goals. Uh, there we go. Um, so that meets my sleep goals. And I've changed this once and then I tap done and it says, change the schedule so that you change that all the time, or you can just change your next alarm. Um, and if you just change your next alarm only, um, then when I lock my phone and then unlock my phone um, and then go to shortcuts again, you can now see my alarm says 6 a.m. Um, and uh, then of course I can change it or skip. I'm actually going to skip it tomorrow. I don't need alarm. Um, but if it says no alarm, no wake up alarm set, you can change that. Um, now I do want to just have a quick look over in shortcuts because there are some options here. Um, and specifically uh, in automation, if you create an automation and then create a personal automation, there's a sleep option for when wind down begins. Um, and so you can do some automations based on this. Um, and, uh, you know, you can turn on alarms. Um, so you can toggle an alarm, you can create an alarm, you can get all alarms, but you'll see that there's nothing here about sleep. And this is the, the roadblock that I ran into. Um, so I've got the Overcast app installed. So that's why I've got some sleep options from there and, and Downcast as well. But there's nothing about specifically, you know, turning off your sleep alarm. So you can choose to toggle an alarm. Um, and you can see I've created a whole bunch of alarms here. And I do have three bedtime um, alarms, um, but they didn't seem to do anything. When I toggled them off for this morning, I used a, 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 my iPad as my alarm clock this morning to make sure that I actually definitely woke up. Um, but all of my bedtime alarm came on as usual, even though I have those three bedtime options there. It, it, 
it just ran. And I don't know if this is an iOS 15 bug. It might be. Um, or if this is something else. But what you can do is you should give this a try if you want to run it through a shortcut, um, especially if there's a couple of different times that you like to get up at um, and you, you just choose them ad hoc based on, you know, what's going to be on your calendar for the day. Um, but the actions that you're looking for are turn um, the alarm off um, and then, you know, turn on whatever the other one is or create the other one. Um, and you can either do this as part of an automation, um, you know, when wind down begins, show a menu and then ask you to do that. Um, or you can, you know, have just run a shortcut manually. Um, so that that's your options. But personally, I do think, um, you know, this the lock screen shortcuts are going to be your best option there. Um, if you don't have uh, shortcuts, I'll just make sure my data is shared with Apple. Um, then in the, in, in the health app, uh, in sleep, um, it's it's not quite right there. I have actually been sleeping. I promise you. Um, <laughs> then um, you can you can scroll down. You've got uh, showing all your data and everything, and um, options. You've got your your wind down. You need to make sure wind down is on um, for this to happen. And then uh, darn it, my curve lost again. Full schedule and options. There we go. Wind down shortcuts. Um, and if you just add a shortcut here, there's things like day one and and notes and things like that. Music. Um, and then you can also just straight up select an app from your app library, which might be useful. So if you, if there's an app that you always use at bedtime, um, say, for example, um, you you are maybe a bit further east than me and you go to sleep listening to Twitch shows, then you can listen to Twitch shows live through the broadcasts app. Um, so, uh, you, you know, that's, that's an option for you. Hopefully we don't put you to sleep, um, but that's how you can make sure that you get that up on your home screen. Yeah, I... Uh, I pretty much do that, uh, what, what you just described, um, when it comes to just making adjustments to my sleep, uh, schedule at first, I, it was you actually who taught me that. And I think you're answering some other question, but you were showing, um, that when you tap on that little button that brings up the shortcuts that you have during your wind down, that there was the option to change the alarm. So I just tapped change alarm and switched it. And the part that I, I knew that that option was there, but what I didn't know was that you could just select it for the next day. I thought that by yeah. doing that, it would completely change the schedule. So once I knew that it would change just for the next day, I thought, or I realized, oh, that's exactly what I wanted. That's exactly what I needed. I'm good to go. This is, you know, the feature that I needed. So it's not automated per se, but it is still very easy for me to do. And I kind of, for me, I like that it's not automated because different days require different, um, you know, settings. It, it, it all depends on if I'm feeling like, uh, proper sleep hygiene, or if I'm, uh, deciding to cave and, you know, wake up at a different time instead. All right. This next one comes from Dave from, oh man, I know from Canada, but I don't want to mispronounce Mississauga is my guess. Mississauga, Canada. Uh, although it could be Mississauga. Uh, but anyway, Dave from Canada, uh, I'm sorry that I may have mispronounced the place in Canada from where you hail, from whence you hail. All right. <clears throat> Hello, Micah and Rosemary. Nice job you two do on the iOS Today show. Hey, thanks. Uh, I have an Eve energy monitor that my washing machine is plugged into. How can the energy monitor send a message to my iPhone using the Eve app and or the HomeKit app when the washing machine is finished? Is there a better way to do this? Thanks for your help. Dave from Canada. Tell me, Rosemary, is there a better way? I know which way you use. Uh, and so I'm curious to hear your, your solution for this, because I'll be honest with you, I have one of these things on my washer and I can't figure out how to get it to work. Okay. Um, well, there's, there's a, a couple of different ways that you can do this. Um, now I, I should mention, um, all smart plugs can allow different amounts of energy through, and some of them may or may not be able to support the amount of energy drawn by a washer. Uh, and dryers in particular are just something you probably don't want to try. Uh, source, I plugged one of these in for my dryer and then my dryer started shutting off after, after like three minutes. Um, and it turned out that I've killed my Eve energy plug with this. Uh, but the one on my washing machine is still going fine. So I am going to pull up my iPhone here um, and uh, I'm just going to show um, a couple of options. So, um, or walk people through things. So there's, there's options for automations here, um, but you'll see... Um, uh, there we go. People arriving and leaving has shown up properly now. Um, that there is there is not a whole bunch of options here that I can use for when 
uh, energy stops being drawn. And this is kind of the problem because actually washers and dryers, um, at least more modern ones, are pretty much always drawing a very small amount of energy. So you need to figure out when it stops. And this is where things get a little bit tricky. Um, so I am actually not using that at all. I am doing something different. And uh, I'm just going to pop back and go into my uh, da, 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 home automation. So you can see I have four shortcuts here. I've got washing machine running, tumble dryer running, monitor washing machine, and monitor tumble dryer. Okay, and the washing machine and the tumble dryer have exactly the same setup. The tumble dryer ones are now defunct because, you know, the tumble dryer killed it. Uh, smart plug. Um, and uh, so I'll look into the washing machine. Okay, so I have uh, created um, a automation setup using uh, another system called Homebridge. Now, for anybody who's not familiar, Homebridge um, is a application that you can install on something like an always on Mac mini um, or a Raspberry Pi. Um, and it can allow you to add devices to HomeKit that don't have HomeKit support. It can also, however, allow you to add fake devices. And I have dummy switches in my uh, HomeKit setup. Um, and if I just swipe down and then I go into my home and then I open Logic, then you'll see some of these fake devices. So I've got tumble dryer running off, washing machine running is off, asleep is off, bedtime is on because I turned on that sleep option earlier, so I'll turn that off. Brush cup clean, that's my robot vacuum. Um, I even have things like a lava lamp timer. So if my lava lamp turns on, then it turns on this timer. Um, and then after eight hours, that automatically turns it off. Um, and you can see here, I've got these washing machine and tumble dryer ones, okay? And these are just fake switches, okay? And they are there purely as a little flag for status. You could solve this in other ways, but I decided that the easiest way to do this was this because, you know, I, I was doing other things there. So to start with, it gets the state of whether or not the washing machine is running, okay? And it goes, either it's on or it's off, okay? Um, if it's if it's on, then this does nothing because there's other things already happening. Um, and so it just stops. And then if it's uh, not, so, and then if it, if it is running, it gets um, a custom input, okay? And I had to go through all of these and figure this out. And I don't remember exactly what it is now, but uh, the second one for me on my Eve Energy plug turned out to be the right option to monitor. And then it says, if it's greater than zero, then it's going to tell, I've got a little uh, iPod touch around here somewhere. I can't reach it at the moment, um, but that's running a, a system called Pushcut Home Server. So it tells Pushcut Home Server, hey, do this shortcut, washing machine running. It sets the washing machine running to true. Um, oh, sorry, it sends me a notification to my phone and says the washing machine thinks it's running. Um, and then it tells me how much energy it's using. Um, and then it, it executes that. And then this is where things get a little crazy um, because... Um, it, it looks up the information in another app called data jar. Um, and you're probably thinking this is sounding very, very complicated, but I'm, I'm going to yes. finish. Um, because what I do is whenever my washing machine is running, I save this data, um, every, every 15 minutes, how much energy is it using? Now I'm not saving this to calculate my power bill, um, because I, I could, but I, have a smart monitor for my, my meter anyway, so I know how much it, energy is, uh, is costing me at the moment. So it gets um, the, um, the, the, the information, it saves my current energy usage with the, with the current date and time into data jar. It gets the state of washing machine running, um, and then it says, hey, if it's less than five, because I found if it's using less than five, that means it's basically off. Um, then it toggles everything off and it sends me a notification and it adds empty the washing machine to my due reminders list with, the, with an alert now. Um, and otherwise, it saves the information um, and then says, hey, in 15 minutes, run this, or sorry, in 10 minutes, run this whole thing again. So it's saving this information and it checks then every 10 minutes. But basically you need to have something somewhere which is going to be sitting there and watching and waiting for the energy usage to go down. And it has to go down below a specific point. And I found just because it goes down there at a specific point, it might not stay there. So it, my, my washing always ends up sitting in the machine for an extra 10 minutes after this uh, because it runs the cycle again and it goes, hey, we're still below. Great. You're good. Go empty the washing machine because if it sat below that for, for more than, you know, 10 minutes, basically, um, then I can empty the machine because there are soak cycles where 
barely draws any energy because it's just, you know, ticking a timer going, yeah, it needs to soak for another couple of minutes. Okay, good. Now we can start doing the washing part again. Um, so yeah, I save, oop, my light bulbs just escaped. Uh, so it saves this information and it pulls it in because you need to compare it somehow every single time. Um, and it, it's just a little bit tricky to be able to do that um, otherwise. Um, so just saying, hey, this is finished is probably going to be a little bit harder. Um, I have looked into this. I have spent a lot of time. There's a reason why I have this super crazy setup. The alternative setup is buying a smart washer. Um, and that that was more money than I was willing to pay um, to test these things out. Um, so smart washers don't have HomeKit integration usually, uh, but they will have an app integration, Miele, M-I-E-L-E, uh, M -I -E -L -E, uh, make some. I've heard good things about their stuff. Um, they, they also have an app that works for their dishwasher and for their dryer. Um, uh, apparently Samsung stuff does as well, but your mileage may vary as to uh, how good that is and how that works. Um, but uh, yeah, the, it's it's complicated, basically. It can be done with shortcuts, as I'm demonstrating here, uh, but you're going to want something like uh, Pushkit. Uh, you're going to need uh, another device running Pushkit server um, and then, um, or Pushkit server, and then you'll you'll need, um, you know, the, the plug as well um, to, to get all this done. So it's crazy. It's doable. Uh, and uh, feel free. Uh, to reach out uh, via chat or emails again if you want a bit more information. I happily share these shortcuts, um, but unless I spend a lot of time uh, walking you through how to set them up, um, I think it might be a little bit crazy. So if you want them, let me know and I'll happily share them with you. Can I ask you something? How often does it do, does the automation not work as expected? Um, I mean, this when, on the washing machine is working perfectly. It always tells me when my washing is finished. Um, wow. So I am very impressed with that. Um, the Okay, it's failed once or twice because an update has started installing on the iPod Touch and then you have to start it again. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I, 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 I have a fail safe in that uh, when it comes back up, it checks and it goes, hey, okay, 10 minutes. No, 10 minutes again, right? Okay, yeah, okay. You should probably empty the washing machine. And like, yeah, I, I did that three hours ago. We're fine. Um, but um, That's yeah, very it, impressive. It, it, it's it's impressive how stable it is for how crazy this setup seems. Because exactly. I'm aware this seems insane. It's mad. There's so many dependencies. It's running itself on a loop. Um, you know, this is programming in, in the sense. Um if you want an easier solution, Dave, then you're willing to get, you know, your hands into, into some code, perhaps. I would recommend looking into Home Assistant. Now, Home Assistant itself can't integrate with Eve, but I'm pretty sure some people on their forums might be able to help you. There's automation systems uh, for, for Home Assistant called Node-RED that you can install into that, that that can probably do this much better than how I'm doing it here. But this is my pure shortcuts solution. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And it works. <laughs> uh, yeah, it works. Um, I, it's just I'm not sure I could recommend it necessarily for everybody else because it is kind of crazy to set up and you need to make sure that everything's working perfectly um, in order for that to happen. Uh, my next step is to set this up where the button on my washing machine actually runs through um, through a push cut server where it runs this washing machine is running one instead of me saying to my home pod washing machine running. Um, but you know, it works. Yeah. That's I, like I said, um, the fact that it, you actually get it working every time or yeah. almost every time versus some of the time yeah. is yeah. I'm very impressed with that. <laughs> Same. Absolutely. And shocked, yeah. honestly. <laughs> yeah. I, right. I'm also shocked. I was amazed when the, this started working and it was like, hey, go into the washing machine. And I went and the washing machine had finished. And because to start with, it was telling me, go into the washing machine. It's like, the washing machine is still running. I can hear it. Uh, but yeah. Uh, by the way, I did look it up. Mississauga. Mississauga. So uh, from, All right. thank you, Dave, from Mississauga, Canada. Mississauga. Uh, moving... <laughs> there, you heard it. Did you hear it? <sighs> yeah. Uh, scared me. Uh, moving on, Radiator writes in, uh, what is the best video app that can be used for MTS video format that doesn't cost over 10 bucks per month or no subscription at all? It would be great to recode the audio portion of the video. I'm not familiar with MTS video format. No, me either. And I was really hoping you would be because I, I did some digging and I was like, <laughs> 
I, I don't know. This seems like a thing that Micah might know. So I did did some digging and um, it's it's using an advanced video coding high definition format. Um, and this is the standard video format used by Sony and Panasonic camcorders. Um, it's the one saved on Blu-ray discs, uh, among other things. Um, and it's one of those things where I did some digging and I, I struggled to find any apps that could support this. Um, so my suggestion uh, for Radiator, um, who posted this, I think actually he asked us during Mac Break Weekly, Micah, um, but uh, it's going to be, uh, please can you uh, let us know which apps it is um, that you are using. And also this is a call out to our audience because I know our audience is full of incredibly smart mm -hmm. people. Um, and a, we, we love getting your questions, but also we love it when you have different answers for people than mm -hmm. the answers we've given. So if you have a better laundry automation uh, solution for Dave, or you've got a video app suggestion for Radiator, please feel free um, to, to send it in. James in the chat room right now is saying that um, uh, VLC can convert it. Um, I was thinking but that too, it, yeah. It, it, it can't play it natively. And uh, Anthony just popped something up on our screen. Anthony, could you just show that again, yeah, please? Yeah, so we, um, we did. Oh, this has been a, guy. wow. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Leo pretty much recommends like, you know, VLC, if anything, could probably do it. I'm not sure if on the iOS app it can, but definitely on the desktop probably can. And yeah. then he recommended using Handbrake to convert it. But oh, yeah, yeah, Handbrake is yeah. good. Wait, yeah. okay, so is this a question of how can I... Uh, Copy do this on iOS. Break my. Yeah. How can I copy break my video? I mean, it might. It could be a home video too, because it's. Uh, oh, yeah, because it's Sony camcorders yeah. as well. Okay. Sony gotcha. and Panasonic camcorders. Um, so yeah, my my suggestion is probably going to be for Radiator. Uh, try your Mac. Uh, iFlix is a great app. It's part of Setup. If you uh, have the Setup uh, subscription, um, that can do that and that can convert it and you can put it on your iPad. But just straight. A straight converting things from Sony and Panasonic camcorders onto your iPad. Ah, there's a reason why I moved away from camcorders, unfortunately, many years ago, and especially Sony ones, because they always have these formats and then you can't do anything with them. And there's, it's very uh, sad when that happens. One workaround that might work is uploading it to Google Photos, because effectively that's oh. like a YouTube backend. I mean, you're going to uh, yeah. be restreaming it again, but you know. That uh, could work. It could work. Yeah, there we that's go. That's a bad idea. idea. Yeah. Stop gap. All right. Well, yes, we'll be curious to hear if anybody has any other thoughts on that um, radiator. And uh, yeah, as as far as that goes, there's the we'll include a link to the the tech guy episode. Um, and I like that idea of uh, uploading it to Google Photos and then downloading it in the format of your you know, well, not in the format of your choosing, but in the format that it gets converted to. Uh, and then Mandy writes in. I can't do split screen on my iPad and I'm not sure why. It's a 10.5 inch device and it should support this, but it just doesn't seem to work. Mandy, I totally understand because uh, discoverability for split screen on iPad is difficult and it gets better in iPad OS 15, but uh, notoriously it was difficult in iPad OS's leading up to this one. So yes. I'm not surprised that you do have uh, trouble finding that. Um, but Rosemary, I'm sure that you can help our, uh, our requester with their yes. question. Well, this requester is very near and dear to my heart because this is something my mom messaged me last week. Um, and oh, we uh, I was able to fix it. I went around and I had a poke at her iPad and I discovered something. So I'm going to try pressing a button here and this may or may not work. Um, oh, this is interesting. Uh, no, okay. I still don't do this. I just don't have this button. So, uh, Micah, if you could show your yes. iPad, please, then I'm going to walk you through doing this. So if you pop into the settings application, please. All right. Um, and then you go down inside Oops. of settings to home screen and dock. Um, because it turns out home that it's, it's not just discoverability that's the problem. If you see there, you've got an option for um, multitasking or multitasking. If you tap on that, then there's a toggle at the top there that says allow multiple apps. And it oh. turns out you can turn off split screen and multitasking, slide over and all of these things. And I have a feeling three or four years ago, my mom managed to start opening apps in split screen and she never 
managed to figure out how she was doing it. And she always complained about it. So I dug around and I found the setting and I turned it off for her. Um, And then of course, time goes by and she finds out that you can do this. And this is pretty cool and it's quite useful. And it didn't work. Um, And this is like three or four iPads later, probably because, you know, split screen came out. She had it for a month. She hated it. It kept popping up. And so I must have disabled it back in the day. And uh, yeah, so here's how you can turn that on and off. So if you have a relative who keeps opening things in split screen and doesn't want that, uh, then you can toggle this feature off for them. Or of course, uh, if you are finding that you hate split screen right now, then you can toggle it off and then toggle it back on when iOS 15 comes out. Um, but there we go. That's that's how you can do that. Um, I was quite amazed that I managed to find the setting. Uh, it turns out it doesn't show up when you do split screen. You have to search for something else. But then uh, then I found it in the settings and I was quite pleased uh, that I was able to do that. Um, so, uh, yes. <laughs> that's wonderful. That Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, sometimes those things feel very difficult uh, to, to find. Yeah, because I was there down, and I thought, so. no, 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 she's just using like split screen rowing. Like I tried dragging something from the dock and it was just like, no, I'm just going to replace the app on your screen. It's like... Okay, Something, something's not right here. What what you happened? Like I reboot the iPad? No, install updates? No updates? Okay, what is this? Okay, there's a setting. Nice. All right, that means we've reached the end of the feedback segment, so it's time for app caps. App caps, folks. This is the part of the show where we wear caps atop our head to honor our picks of the week. These are apps or devices or objects that we are using that we want to share with all of you or maybe new things we've come across that we think you might be into. And uh, we wear these caps to say we how much we love, to show how much we love these apps. All right, Rosemary Orchard, tell us about the cap atop your head and then tell us your pick of the week. Well, Captain Jack has already got a guess for my app cap, which is not correct. Uh, But, you know, I can see why. I'm wearing a traffic cone hat. It's foamy. It's cute. It's soft. It's not as heavy as a real uh, traffic cone, which is a good thing. And my (laughs) app cap of the week is an app that I was talking about after the show last week. Um, And uh, somebody said, hey, you should pick that as your app cap. I think it was you, Micah. Um, So my app cap this week is an app called Pixo. So Pixo, P-I-C-S-E-W, has officially one purpose, and that is to sew images together. So I've taken a, a, a screenshot or multiple screenshots of one of my shortcuts earlier. And if I tap recent scroll shot here at the bottom, you'll see, look at that. It's stitched three screenshots together to make one big screenshot. But it doesn't just do that. So if it's managed to do this wrong, then you can actually tap on the button in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and then you can actually adjust any of these individually. I'm not going to do that because it's done it perfectly. There's also a crop option where you can crop things, um, individual photos, and then you can crop as a whole. And you can uh, then edit and, and slide things up and down if you want to, to uh, make everything absolutely perfect yourself. But tools is where Pixo shines. Yes. So to start with, you've got a little phone at the bottom um, and then you can add, for example, a frame. And this looks redonkulous because <laughs> I've got a humongous iPhone now. And yes, the word is redonkulous for this. Um, and I can change so I can use a silver iPhone, a blue iPhone Pro or a gold iPhone Pro. Uh, I think I can go with blue. Um, and then I've got a magic wand tool. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned in the devices, you can also select a different device. Uh, So say, for example, if this was a 12 Pro, then I could do that. Um, Or a 12 Mini, then I could select Purple, for example, if I wanted it to be a Mini. Um, You'll notice uh, if I zoom in here at the top, the Mini has got a slightly different uh, radius. So uh, some of the things have been blocked out. So you want to probably match it up to your device class. Um, And you can also just uh, change the background if you want to. Um, And I like to have no background because then these are PNGs. Uh, which means that the background is transparent. Um, so our next option here is removing the scroll bar. Um, and there's there's this really long scroll bar from where I was taking screenshots. If I remove that, it just uses magic, basically, machine learning, uh, to get rid of that. Um, and then at the top, there's some options to uh, clean up my status bar. Now, because my phone was plugged in um, to um, my Mac when I took this, it already had the time at 9.41. But it's adjusted things as well to try and match it up with the whole uh, iPhone mini thing. Uh, I also have options to uh, do uh, collage type things. Um, and then I can also obscure data. Um, so say, for example, this end if was very uh, important and I wanted to get rid of it, then I can just color that out. 
or I can undo that and I can go over it with this pixelate, uh, sorry, the smudge type feature, or the last one is a pixelation. Now, remember with pixelation, uh, some of these can be reverse engineered. Um, so if you, if you want to completely obscure, I would go with just drawing over the top of it because then it, it's gone and there's no way people can reverse that. You can, of course, also add text. Uh, so I'm just going to write hello world. Uh, and I'm going to make that purple, of course. And then I can just move that around uh, if I want to, uh, just by dragging it. And I can tap on it at any point to edit it. Uh, and there's also highlighting features. So if I just zoom out a little bit and then I say, hey, I want to draw a line like right here. Um, and then I also want to add a box around this option here because that one's very important. Um, then I can do that. Um, and then I can just go ahead and save it. And then when it exports to photos, it says, hey, do you want to delete the first three photos that I stuck together for you? And yes, yes, I do pick so. I want to do that. Um, because now when I go back, uh, those three photos have gone and just that one photo is remaining. Um, and where I use this is a lot of the time I take a screenshot, okay? And people get very angry about battery life on the internet. <laughs> Um, and I, Micah, I'm sure you've experienced this as well. If my phone has got low battery, then people notice. Also, if I'm taking screenshots mm -hmm. from for an article and the timestamps are out of order, so I take the screenshots in an order that feels logical and then I put them in the article and then the timestamps are out of order, sometimes you get an email about this. I don't know why people worry about these things, but they seem to worry about these things. Um, and so I love this clean... Uh, 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 toolbar um, option just because you can get rid of that. And of course, you know, being able to add device frames on things, um, you know, it's pretty nice. It just allows you to uh, go ahead and do that. And then because this is just one photo, I can delete the original or I cannot. Um, there are some further options in settings um, where um, save can, for example, auto delete source images. So it's always going to ask you. There's export dimensions if you want the largest possible, small or custom. You can save it to a specific app album. Now that's I use because it helps me clean up my photo library. Um, and you can prefer saving as a PNG. Um, and this means that when you have that transparent background, it will actually be transparent. So if you're watching the video here, you can see my hand goes behind my phone, okay? If I, ex and, and this is exactly like something that comes out of Pixo, except this is a live image um, uh, here. Um, you can also um, enable hike, lossless compression and so on. You can do uh, watermarks um, if you want. So for example, if you always want uh, the text of Rosemary Orchard, then you can have that say appear in the bottom right-hand corner in purple. Um, and there's two sample images here. Um, there's horizontal ones, there's vertical ones. Um, you can also do scroll shot recording and things like that. There's web snapshots um, where you can um, save, you can share from the web to uh, Pixo and it will take a snapshot of the whole web page. This is from before that was a native feature in Safari, but it's pretty cool. Um, there's there's um, some advanced things like the scroll shot uh, recording and the stitching. Uh, watermarks, callback URLs, and exporting high-quality images um, are all pro features. Um, that's an in-app purchase, um, and I believe that was $1.99 for that. Um, but this is a great application, and I love tidying up my screenshots with Pixo. Uh, so, uh, yeah, feel free to give it a go, people. Nice. Uh Love that. Um, I like Pixo has there were there've been a bunch of different apps that do that kind of thing, but Pixo is absolutely the best one that I've come across. Uh, especially because so many of them do it with and it's again, it's like a black box feature and it just does it. And if it's messed up, then you just have to retake screenshots to try again. With Pixo, you can actually, as you showed, edit to get it exactly how you need it. And that is what I think sets it apart. Um, along with, as you pointed out, those tools for removing things that get people all bent out of shape. Um, yes. So yeah. all of that helps yeah. whether, us. Whether it's things sure. like you've got personal information in a in a screenshot and you just want it hidden, or you you just want to tidy up the time um, in all those screenshots, it's a free app to download. And then there's a $1.99 in-app purchase if you want the pro. Uh, if you've had, if you purchased the app a long time ago, then you, it might just be 99 cents to upgrade um, to, to Pixo uh, Pro. Uh, there's also a standard option, which is 99 cents in the app, but it's all explained when you download it. Um, and these are one-time uh, in-app purchases. So 
Here. So I uh, got a new hat that I'm very excited about. Um, this is just a blue dad cap, as they call them these days. I, we used to call them baseball caps, um, but it is uh, a hat with a, an embroidered word on it that says vaccinated. And this is partially for other folks, uh, but also partially for me. Uh, now that California has uh, relaxed the rules on masking um, and given that I am fully vaccinated, it would be nice to go places and not uh, feel the need to wear a mask. But oftentimes I feel a little bit, um, uh, you know, sort of bad about going into a place and not wearing a mask if people don't know that I'm vaccinated. So this is just a signal that kind of sends out, hey, I'm vaccinated. Uh, I'm not wearing a mask, but I promise it's okay. Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's why I got this hat. And then I realized, oh, it's perfect for iOS today as well. Uh, so, yes, this is the hat atop my head. I got it on Amazon. Uh, they sell them in a bunch of different colors. Obviously, I didn't get red. Um, so let's talk about my app cap, which is um, a new one that's come out called Breathable. And Breathable is a very simple app, and uh, I like it that way. It is, it's available for $1.99 in the App Store, and it is an app that's sole purpose is to tell you about the air quality in your area. So it is um, <clears throat> primarily a, a widget app. It is made to be a widget uh, for you. And so here you can see I've got it set up with... Um, information and it shows the kind of meter from green all the way to brown uh, with the AQI, the air quality index uh, in my area. It's 42 right now, which is quite good uh, in the green area. Could be, you know, even better, but green is good. Uh, and you can see on the right there, it actually shows good. Uh, this is the PM 2.5 rating. And then it tells you when it last checked this. Uh, so right now it is uh, 12.51 p.m. as we're recording this in Pacific time. And uh, it checked it today at 12 o'clock p.m. So if you tap into the app, you can pull up um, the settings for this. And it includes the settings for the small widget and the medium widget. And uh, this information, you can uh, set it to have the highest air quality index value, or you can set it to prefer the uh, readings from one of the sites that you've set up with it. So there's airnow.gov and iqair.com, which both have sources. And then you can also use the uh, number for the air quality index, or you can tap to turn on emoji values, uh, which lets you just kind of get a quick look. So if you, you know, you're maybe not as familiar with those uh, emoji value or with the number values, then the emoji value can help. Um, you can change the way that it looks uh, in terms of whether it's the textual style, meaning that it kind of prefers a more minimal look or that graphics style where it's a lot larger. You can turn on or off the color border, which the color border matches the current AQI um, rating. And then you can also choose to have the logo for where it is pulling that information. Um, so it, it might be usair.gov or it could be the IQ Air uh, rating. Then you can change the font style. So if you want it to be um, uh, the, the round typeface, the sans typeface, mono typeface, or serif typeface. I just have it on round, uh, and then you can choose the um, weight of the font. And then I have it set to match the system color, uh, but you can always have it be in dark mode or always in light mode. And then you can see, again, the small widget or the medium widget. Um, and then the bottom right corner is uh, API keys. And I'm not going to tap on that because then it will show my API keys. Uh, but this app works with the APIs for the different sites that it pulls the information from. So you have to go and set up an API key and account with, with the sites that you choose to use to like pulling in the data. However, it's very simple to do and the app will walk you through the process. So in no time at all, I was able to get uh, those API keys set up and get AQI uh, information from two different sources uh, so that it can use the larger of those two values, uh, which you may find to be, you know, your best bet. Um, and then what I love about this is that it's available, excuse me, on my iPhone. It's available on my iPad, of course, as a widget, but it's also available on the Mac as a widget. So if you're moving between all these different devices and you want to quickly see what your AQI is, no matter where you are, I've got it right now in um, Mac OS Big Sur available there to show me the values for uh, auto quality index. I love it. I think it's fantastic. Um, again, 
$1.99. And oh, by the way, uh, if you could scroll down just a hair, because I'm not exactly sure which one they're sending it to. Yes, a portion of proceeds from the sale of this app will be donated to one of several climate change foundations, including the Clean Air Task Force, Climate Change Emergency Fund, and the Union of Concerned Scientists. So it, you, when you buy this app, you're also supporting some great organizations that are uh, making sure that you know, our planet is livable for a lot longer. So feel good while you're buying this app and then also feel good uh, knowing the AQI and whether uh, it's time to get masked up again because of, uh, in our case, California fires, uh, which have reduced the air quality uh, outside. So really neat app, very simple app and uh, a quick way to get information for your air quality in your area. So important. I think we undervalue and underestimate the importance of the air we breathe uh, because it's just something we take for granted. Um, and so when some, I should say some of us take for granted, not everybody, but that some of us take for granted. And when you are paying attention to that, you may start to get an understanding of, oh, that's why I don't feel so great. Or that's why I keep coughing. So yes, that is uh, my app, Breathable, available in the App Store for $1.99. All right, uh, folks, this brings us to the end of this episode of iOS Today. Uh, if you have questions, feedback, etc., that you'd like to send our way, uh, thank you. We've seen a lot. Uh, we've seen an increase in um, feedback and questions, and uh, we love that. So keep sending it. It's iOS Today at twit.tv. You can tweet at us with the hashtag AskIOSToday, or you can message us in uh, the Discord, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, with your feedback and questions. A lot of times questions come up during the show, and we end up answering them on the next episode, or sometimes you're inspired during Mac Break Weekly to ask a question and uh, then you uh, have your question answered on the next show. So thank you to those of you who have written in. And even if you've written in before, if you've got another question, feel free to send it in to us. Um, you can tune in live every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, 1800 UTC to watch the show by going to twit.tv slash live. Uh, we happen to think that the best way to get the show is by subscribing to it or following it, depending on the verb you use, uh, by going to twit.tv slash iOS and subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, basically whatever you are, whatever you use, wherever you are, we try to be there. You can subscribe in audio and video formats. Uh, this show, we definitely recommend getting the video format. It is uh, uh, great to see kind of what we're talking about as we're talking about it, but um, we do our best to make sure that uh, the it's accessible as just an audio show. Show as well. Um, I should mention, uh, now that I, I said I would, uh, about the Discord, uh, that is part of something we call Club Twit. Uh, Club Twit is our membership uh, service. For seven bucks a month, you can join Club Twit and get every single one of our shows ad-free, which is awesome. Uh, so all the shows, no ads. Uh, you also get access to an exclusive Twit Plus bonus feed, where we've got content you won't find anywhere else, and you can join the members-only Discord server where you can chat with us hosts and producers and other folks who work at Twit and also uh, hang out with other people who are part of the community. Uh, we love our Discord community. So much fun uh, we're having there. For seven bucks a month, you too can be a part of the fun. Twit.tv slash club twit. And the other thing I'll mention is Tech Break, twit.tv slash TB to find Tech Break. Uh, Tech Break is a, if, if you've subscribed to the Twit Bits feed, then uh, you are good to go there. Uh, but we've in, improved upon or have added to Twit Bits uh, with Tech Break, which is a way for uh, hosts to quickly and easily share information with all of you. So say some tech news breaks or I get a new product in the mail that I really excitedly want to talk about or a new version of the iOS beta comes out and it's got features that you might want to know about. All of those things are where we put, uh, all of those things are options for this. So twit.tv slash TB if you want to check that out. It's available for free. Uh, so you can go there and subscribe or follow. Uh, no extra cost and get that stuff that's happening minute to minute. Uh, and now it is time, Rosemary, uh, for you to tell us if folks want to follow you online and check out all your great work, where do they go to do so? 
Uh, well, the best place to go is rosemaryorchard.com, uh, where you can find uh, links to me and all of the things that I do. And uh, of course, you can find me as well on micro.blog and Twitter with the username Rosemary Orchard. And you'll frequently find me uh, in the chat room as well uh, of the uh, Discord of Club Twit. Uh, so feel free to ask questions there if you've got them. And you never know, they might appear in our next show. Micah, where Absolutely. can people find you? You can find me at Micah Sargent on many a social media network or head to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. Uh, Thank you for hanging out with us today for iOS Today. Uh, I hope we answered your questions and helped you figure out what you wanted to do with your photos and uh, a way to improve upon the ones you have. Uh, Until next time, this is iOS Today. I'm Micah Sargent, that's Rosemary Orchard, and we thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, Hands-On Photography, here on Twit TV. Each and every week, Thursday, that is, I like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop. It's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera. It can be the simplest of things like Leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder. All of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up. So subscribe to the show today. That's twit.tv slash hop. And I look forward to talking to you soon.